So then a lot of times we'll crave something that is more contracted. And, and a lot of times that can be something like salt or red meat or eggs or something like that. Something that's a bit more heavy and hearty. Um, something that they would say like really puts meat on your bones. That's one way that that can happen. Another way that can happen is if you have a lot of stressful or contracted activities, then you reach for something that's on the opposite end of that spectrum, which tends to be the sugar and the caffeine and the things that will lift you up. So if you end up getting yourself into this cycle. If we allow ourselves to kind of eat in the middle of that cycle, which is um, those foods that are surrounded by the balance point, then it'll be less likely that we'll create these cravings one way or the other. So that's one way to think about food. I'm sorry, I am flipping the minutes. So. <laughs> so then the second challenge around kicking the sugar habit is that it feels really good to eat sugar, right? So we like sugar. Sugar we think is a good thing. And um, a lot of times it's because in nature, naturally, foods that have sugar in it were few and far between. So if you think back to kind of original hunter-gatherer, we sought out sugar because it also told us that it was combined in a package with fiber and with phytonutrients and um, protein and all these other things. So fiber, fat, and protein all slow down the absorption of sugar. And so when we don't have those things in combination with the sugar, then the sugar goes straight into the blood and the pancreas reacts. And it reacts by releasing insulin. Um, problem is, is that because we're in a society where we've been, we've had a lot of exposure to foods that do spike our insulin so much, so often, our bodies become really good at overreacting to insulin production. So if you send your blood sugar on a spike and you're at, let's say, at the top of a roller coaster and then it starts to come down and crash because your pancreas actually secretes too much insulin, our pancreas has gotten way too good at doing its own job. So it actually pushes too much insulin. So instead of bringing it to this balance point here in the middle, it actually sends it crashing and dipping down. And that's when you experience that sugar crash after that sugar high. And what do you crave in the middle of the crash? More sugar. <laughs> Funny how that works out. So to the body and the brain, that is an emergency situation. And part of the reason for that is because your brain uses up 50% of your sugar at any point in time, at any given time. So when you're, you're going through this huge sugar crash, your brain actually thinks this is an emergency situation. And so it's trying to overcompensate for that. So what happens is then insulin is tasked to take all this excess sugar that's now floating around during the middle of this crash to different parts of the body. But if it gets to these places and it sees that the fat cells are already overloaded with sugar, then it doesn't really have another storage facility to put the sugar in. So the only other places it can put the sugar are either in the brain, in the blood cells, or in the muscle tissue. And all these receptors end up saying, okay, well, if you're, you've already maxed me out, then where else am I gonna put the sugar except in the fat cells? And so then they build more and more and more until eventually we find ourselves feeling sluggish and filled with all the toxins and the toxic reactions from the sugar and they all get stored in the places where we definitely don't want them to be. Um, the other problem with that is that when there's all this excess sugar that's stored as fat, it prevents your body from turning on something called glucagon. Glucagon is what's needed to basically unlock or open the fat cells so that the lipid proteins can get out of it, um, or so that the lipids can get out of it so that it can actually reuse that or transform the body in different ways. I don't like to say or tell people to lose fat because what happens when you lose your keys? You try and find your keys. So if you tell your body, oh yeah, I want to lose weight, you're actually going to end up looking for it again, subconsciously or unwillingly, whether you want to or not. Um, there's a process called transdifferentiation, and what happens during transdifferentiation is that the lipids, after they're released from the cell itself, that shell of a cell actually attaches, usually to the inside of an artery or something like that, but it mimics the same structure as a stem cell which means that depending on the biological information that you 
give to that cell, you can tell it to turn into whatever you want. It can turn into muscle. It can turn into brain tissue. It can turn into bone. So we, there's a way for us to use that to our advantage, but we need to get away from this idea that we're losing fat because then we're essentially telling ourselves that we're losing a part of ourselves. And the subconscious mind does not respond to that well at all. So then the third challenge is that if you're not happy in one area of your life, and it doesn't really matter what area of your life that might be, it could be stress from work or from family, or even just when it's kind of a gloomy day outside, a lot of times it's easier to turn to a coping mechanism like sugar or caffeine or alcohol or anything else. Um, but if you take a step back and you try and ask yourself where those triggers are coming from, a lot of times what you're really craving isn't necessarily food at all. So one of the exercises that I do with a lot of my clients is I'll ask them, okay, do you ever go to your fridge and stand there and look into the abyss? Because I know that I've done that probably about 20 times. <laughs> well, if you're looking into the abyss of your fridge or your pantry or whatever it is, and nothing really jumps out at you that says, oh yeah, I'm really craving that. If I eat that, that's really gonna satisfy me. Then chances are you're not actually craving food. So what I suggest is to make what I call a nourishment menu, which is where you think of all the things that give you joy or make you happy. It can be something like playing with a puppy or taking a walk or taking a bubble bath, whatever it might be. And literally make yourself a little menu of all the things that you love and put it on your fridge. And the next time, if you find yourself going to the fridge and nothing jumps out as being satisfying to you, then take a look at that menu and see if anything jumps out from there. Because chances are there might be something in that menu that is actually what you're craving. But besides those challenges, here are some of the primary solutions um, that I use to help people kick the sugar habit. And you don't have to actually write these down because Jason has all of these on a cheat sheet for you that he's going to hand out. Um, and if you don't mind that blue sheet, that he passed out to everybody. If you could just fill out your contact information and then turn it into him, and then he will give you the seven solutions cheat sheet. Um, this makes it easier so you don't have to jot it all down. And if you'd like to receive weekly emails from me, or even if you're interested in doing like a little trial session or anything like that with me, there are two little check boxes at the bottom of that page, and that's just what that's for. Um, but I do little tips and weekly tricks and stuff like that each week, so if you guys are interested, then please check the box. Um, so, the seven solutions to cure sugar cravings. First thing is to check your beverages. So sometimes sugar cravings are actually a sign of dehydration. And that's one of the easiest ways to get confused when it comes to hunger, is because a lot of times we, we are so um, water deficient, <laughs> Uh, and we're so uh, oversaturated with food availability that we don't really always tell the difference between when we're hungry and when we're thirsty. So I would say check your beverages first and make sure you're drinking enough water. Um, also, if you're someone who drinks a lot of caffeine or drinks a lot of coffee, uh, I recently, have any of you guys checked out most of the booths here? You can see most of the booths here. Um, there's one at the Thermography Center of Dallas so I recently went there and they do thermogram scans where they can actually see kind of the health of all the internal organs, everything that's going on, it's a whole body sort of thing. And what came up that was super interesting to me was that when you drink caffeine, it actually shuts down your digestive system. So that's why um, people who, if you're gonna drink coffee, if you're gonna drink caffeine, drink it in say the afternoon or after the meal because otherwise you're closing off your ability to absorb a lot of the nutrients that you're going to be ingesting anyway. So go check them out if you haven't already because they can do the scan to figure out all that stuff for you. Um, second solution is veg sweet vegetables, fruits, and spices. A lot of times we overlook spices as having sweetness, um, but when I did drink coffee, I used to put cinnamon in my coffee instead of sugar because cinnamon has a natural sweetness to it. And when it's blended in with the coffee, it actually gives it a much sweeter taste. Um, so there are different spices that allow you to kind of trick your taste buds and trick your brain into thinking that you're eating sugar, even if you're not. So another one is sleep. 
And I know that for a lot of people, this is way easier said than done. Um, sleep quality is wildly important. And I know that a lot of us, um, we work all the time or we always have our cell phones near us or around us. Easiest thing you can do is turn your phone on airplane mode when you're sleeping because it won't interrupt your, um, your ability to use your alarm or anything like that. But even just turning off your cell phone will help you slip into a deeper state of REM sleep and will help improve your sleep quality pretty easily. Um, and everybody needs a different amount of sleep. It really just depends on the individual and what works best for you. But if you're somebody who needs a solid nine hours of sleep, then try your best to get that nine hours of sleep. Something else that helps is having um, a nightly or a bedtime ritual. So it could be something as simple as doing some gratitude writing or uh, which um, my coach Jason back there has had me do on a number of occasions. Um, and that's been wildly helpful. But even just establishing something that you do every single night before you go to bed, can tell your brain and signal your brain, hey, okay, it's time to go to sleep. So something else is to check your protein. Um, if you don't have enough protein, then it can cause you to crave sugar and to overeat. If you have too much protein, then again, you get to that contracted tension state and you can again crave sugar and overeat. So it's really about finding the right amount of protein that works for you. Not just the right amount, but the right type. So one of the things that I do with clients is a four-day energy experiment. And that's where I actually have them eat different types of protein at different times of day. And then they write down what their energy level feels like right afterwards, and then about two hours after that. So by kind of keeping a watch and observing if their energy levels go up or down or how they change throughout the day, then we can identify which protein works best for their body type. I was working with a, a pro golf player for a little while and he was having a lot of trouble with mental fog during his golf tournaments. And we did the four day protein experiment and he realized that he does way better on plant protein than he does on animal protein for his particular body type. Um, so we switched over to some plant-based protein snacks and meals and stuff like that and he had the best mental clarity of any tournament of his career. So it really does make a huge difference. Um, something else to do is to sniff out low-fat and fat-free foods. And if you guys are here at the Wellness Expo, it's probably something you already know, but just as a reminder, a lot of times when manufacturers make low-fat or fat-free <laughs> foods, the only way for them to keep it from tasting like cardboard is to put sugar in it. So a lot of times they've got sugar hidden in places you wouldn't expect, and there's at least 25 plus names for sugar dextrose, glucose, maltodextrose, cane sugar, I mean the list goes on and on. And if you're interested in getting a full list of what all those names are, shoot me an email, my contact info, you have it on the handout. And I'll send that over to you. But it's amazing how much sugar they hide in places. So a lot of times a full, what's considered a full fat food option is actually still gonna be a better option because it's not loaded with chemicals and sugar. Um, another thing is movement. Movement is really great for cutting sugar cravings. Um, I'm not somebody who tells people to go to the gym because I don't like the gym. <laughs> um, but I do encourage movement. And by that I mean move in a way that makes you happy and makes your body happy. Uh, just like when you're going, when your pancreas is secreting insulin and you're blocking your glucagon production, that production can also be blocked when you're stressed out. So what happens is if you're forcing yourself to go to the gym and you're forcing yourself to work out, you're already putting your body in a stressed out state. Um, so you're already putting your body in a stressed out state and that alone can turn off your glucagon production, which means you're not transferring anything to anywhere and you're not gonna get the results that you want on your body. Um, and then the final one is to create post-meal rituals. So doing little things like if you realize that you're starting to get full, but you have a tendency to just keep eating, um, if you take your, like your fork and knife and cross it and put it over your plate. Uh, when I was living in China, um, the, the phrase that they would say to signal to the host that you're completely full and that like, you definitely don't want any more because otherwise they keep feeding you is chabala. 
Um, so I still use that today. A lot of times if I'm eating a meal and I realize I'm getting full, I say out loud to myself, I say chipala, because that tells me that I'm full and I don't need to keep eating. Um, so those are my seven tips and tricks. And I think I'm almost out of time. I have 10 minutes. Oh, awesome. I have 10 minutes. I have time for questions. <laughs> Open floor. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? A good plant-based protein. A good plant-based protein, um, something like quinoa. Um, and actually, honestly, you can Google, if you just Google plant-based proteins, um, there's a ton of them. Yeah, there's a whole list. Trying to figure out what protein works best for, for your body. Mm -hmm. Do you just kind of monitor your sluggishness or your how much energy it gives you after you eat it? Or? Yes, I will literally, I'll make a little like chart. And you, so say you put a column here and you say breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then jot down what you ate. And then next to it, have two boxes. Have one for immediately after, and have another box for two hours later. Okay. Just set a little timer on your watch or your phone, and then literally just make a little arrow up or down is the easiest way to do it if you're in a rush. And then you can go back and you can say, oh yeah, when I ate that, my energy went up, and it stayed up even two hours later. Okay. That would be considered a high energy food for you. So, I mean, some people eat more proteins than others. Like, so I now eat dairy, but I used to be vegan and I basically was born that way. Um, much to the chagrin of my parents. But so would I do the same thing with different um, vegetable proteins and try different ones and see if because they're normally the same and everybody's body I guess reacts to different things. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, you can do that with because there are a lot of um, protein-based supplements out there as well. So there's there's whey protein, there's pea protein, there's rice protein. There's now a lot of protein options, and it really is you are your body's best authority. Not the doctor, not me, not anybody else. You're your body's best authority. So it's really about trying different things and monitoring how you feel about it. So what happened was I was a marketing director and I was actually hired by a brain rehabilitation clinic to be the marketing director. Um, and I did that for a little while, but as I was filming all these patient stories, I was just really overwhelmed with um, the transformation that I saw in a lot of these individuals with traumatic brain injury. My, my mom has had an autoimmune condition since before I was born. She's been wheelchair bound and pretty much bedridden since I was about eight. And um, so I, I grew up around it. I grew up seeing the effects of that. But in the brain clinic, I saw people with MS come in and then walk out of their wheelchair two weeks later. Or I saw people who were in, who had traumatic brain injury, and the reason that their brain wasn't healing is because they had an underlying autoimmune or metabolic condition going on. And the problem was is that, you know, as much as the doctors wanted to help, they would tell them, you now have an autoimmune condition, and you need to go home and manage it. But there wasn't anybody to help help that person manage what that would look like or even where to start. Because a lot of times, especially with all the information online, it can be really overwhelming. Um, so I went to the head of the clinic and the board of directors, and I said, look, I pretty much automated your marketing. You don't really need me anymore. I want to help the patients. Will you pay to send me back to school and so that I can go get certified as a health coach in advanced nutrition and then start working with patients? And they agreed. Um, and so I started working with patients in the clinic, and then after that, I just continued working privately. So which brain clinic was my, you were in an accident, my daughter had brain, brain trauma? It was and Cerebrum Health Center. Cerebrum? Mm -hmm. And was that here in Texas? So they actually, they tried to switch over to insurance, um, and because of the nature of the way that healthcare is working currently, um, they had to close the clinic. Uh, there is a very, very similar clinic with a lot of the same doctors that's in Denver, Colorado called Revive. Um, and it's, they do a lot of really, really cool work. I can tell you all about it afterwards if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> or just, again, just email me and I can put you in top, touch with some of the doctors I know and stuff like that. Well, yeah. <clears throat> it's really the only time you can think of sugar is immediately after you have a lot of sugar. Is that because it's something that you've always done? Is it a habit or well, is I, it? Well, that's why I'm asking because when I grew up, after every meal except breakfast, we had dessert. So the minute I finish my lunch, the minute I, I mean, I'm not even hungry, but I'll sit down and eat my lunch or my dinner, I want that sweet. I mean, I have always let myself do it. It is like, I don't know, where is it? Yes. Is that just habit? Some of it is habit, um, some of it is just, we, we put ourselves into these patterns, and once we do patterns over and over again, then it's really hard to break out of that pattern unless we can identify what triggers the pattern and then kind of rewire that neural pathway that tells us to do that behavior. Um, well, I have a deep groove in my neurons or in my brain <laughs> Most likely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then, Oh, another another trick is yeah, that. Maybe, maybe about this way. Yeah. Um, another trick is that if you if you really can't stop eating sugar and you really need something really sweet, um, brown rice sugar is going to be the best substitute. It doesn't spike the insulin the way that the like fructose and glucose do. Um, and I know like I know even a lot of dentists and stuff use that to get kids off the sweets and stuff like that. So really, brown rice syrup or brown rice sugar, if you need a sweetener, then that's the best one to use. What about stevia and what about yes. monk fruit? Yes, stevia and monk fruit are my other two favorites. Yeah. Even organic raw honey if on occasion, just because, but that one I like to use for allergies, um, especially if it's local honey. Uh, I have a friend from, um, uh, not Malaysia, not Madagascar, the other in one. Uh, Macedonia. I have a friend from Macedonia, and their cure for allergies is bee pollen. So it's a similar idea with, uh, with honey, with organic local honey, is that it collects everything from around the area. Your body knows how to process it because it's combined with other nutrients. So that's also one of the better sugars to use. Yeah. How do you feel about the talls? Now the Oh, that's a whole other topic. I will talk to you about that afterwards. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please go to the back of the booth. If you will come this way, if you guys have your booth, stay for a